All right, thank you very much for your opening remarks. Uh, at this point on the webcast, I'd like to present uh, some supplementary material to what Mr. LaRouche just stated on the case of Dodd-Frank. Now, on this, on this uh, broadcast and many other broadcasts that LaRouche PAC is, has done in the past, we've made, uh, we've made a number of jokes about Dodd-Frank. Uh, I'm personally culpable for making plenty of jokes at Barney Frank's expense. There's only one problem with the jokes, given the, uh, the seriousness of the facts. They're not very funny. So what we have in the Congress uh, currently, uh, there have been a number of hearings to look into what was done with the passage of Dodd-Frank uh, when President Obama signed it into law July 21st, 2010. There have been hearings to investigate what happened uh, in meetings that have been conducted by LaRouche PAC activists, LaRouche PAC organizers. There have been Congress people who have said, let's give Dodd-Frank some more time to work. There are people who are still calling Dodd-Frank a piece of regulation uh, or a piece of, uh, or saying that it doesn't go far enough. And I'd say that Dodd-Frank goes plenty far. The Dodd-Frank Act of 2010, among other things, codifies a bail-in. It ensures that the United States uh, can conduct the type of bail-in that we saw in Cyprus in March, the end of March of this year. Uh, under, in the language of the preamble of Dodd-Frank, uh, it claims to protect the American taxpayer by ending bailouts. That is done by implementing bail-in. Title II of Dodd-Frank establishes what's called the Orderly Liquidation Authority, which is an authority given to the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, the FDIC, uh, to, uh, to essentially recapitalize a failed, uh, a failed uh, uh, GCIFI, a globally significant uh, financial institution. Uh, in the event of a failure, the orderly, uh, the orderly liquidation authority uh, kicks in and enables uh, the resolution of cross-border border firms uh, in the language of, uh, of a document published by the FDIC and the Bank of England in December 2012, uh, the resolution strategies, which are in the Orderly Liquidation Authority, uh, are designed to enable large and complex cross-border firms to be resolved without threatening financial stability and without putting public funds at risk. In the U.S., a strategy has been developed in the context of the powers provided by the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act of 2010. Such a strategy would apply a single receivership at the top tier holding company, assign losses to shareholders and unsecured creditors of the holding company, and transfer sound operating subsidiaries to a new solvent entity or entities. In Dodd-Frank, that entity uh, provisions are provided for the creation of that entity, a bridge financial company. Uh, that bridge financial company is then capitalized through the bailing in of that financial institution, namely the unsecured creditors uh, and also uh, anyone who has investments in that, in that company. Now, on the issue of unsecured creditors, the language of Dodd-Frank uh, states explicitly uh, that, excuse me, uh, that the 
contrib- I'm sorry, I'm getting my getting my quotes a little mixed up here. But in the language of Dodd Frank, uh, they wish to ensure that unsecure creditors bear the losses. This, as opposed to having taxpayers bear the losses, and this is done either by taking a write down, or the cre- unsecured creditors are uh, con- they're uh, they're, they are converted into stockholders of this new firm. Now, this was done in the case of the Bankia restructuring earlier this year in March in Spain, uh, which we have covered on the website. Uh, and I'll point out again, this Bank of England FDIC joint report uh, states that to capitalize the new op- operations, one or more new private entities, uh, through one or new op- private entities, the FDIC expects that it will have to look to subordinated debt or even senior unsecured debt claims as the immediate source of capital. The original debt holders can thus expect that their claims will be written down to reflect any losses in the receivership of the parent that the shareholders cannot cover. Now, next, I'd like to take up the issue of the international framework, because Dodd-Frank was not, just as the Cyprus case was not uh, singular to uh, the country of Cyprus, Dodd-Frank is not just legislation on the books of the United States. But in 2009, at the London G20 summit, Uh, the first summit that President Barack Obama ever attended. Uh, It was agreed upon uh, that there would be there would be a G20 framework for cross-border bank resolution. Uh, And this would be done under the guidance of the uh, the Financial Stability Board, which was established in 2009, and their provisions for cross-border resolution, which in reading it are virtually identical to the language, the language is virtually identical to that of the almost 1,000-page Dodd-Frank bill. Uh, But in the language of their document, key attributes of effective resolution regimes for financial institutions published uh, on October 2011, uh, they recommend at the outset of the report that in order to facilitate the coordinated resolution of firms active in multiple countries, jurisdictions should seek convergence of their resolution regimes through legislative, excuse me, through Sorry. Uh, To facilitate the coordinated resolution of firms, uh, they should seek convergence of their resolution regimes through the legislative changes needed to incorporate the tools and powers set out in the document into their national regimes. Now, again, the Financial Security, uh, Financial Stability Board represents the G20 nations uh, in addition to a handful of other nations uh, and um, and other organizations, including ECB, IMF, uh, the infamous Troika, et al. Uh, now, the report goes on to state that these coordin- coordinated bail-in regimes, of which Dodd-Frank is the U.S. incarnation, uh, this resolution authority should have resolution powers over local branches of foreign firms, and the capacity to use its powers either to support a resolution carried out by a foreign home authority, or in exceptional cases, to take measures on its own initiative where the home jurisdiction is not taking action or acts in a manner that does not take sufficient account 
of the need to preserve the local jurisdiction's financial stability. So essentially you're looking at an international bail-in regime with these, with these powers and to conduct cross-border resolution, cross-border bail-in, uh, for example, uh, the United States, um, we have large exposure to banks in the United Kingdom. If the bail-in mechanism were to be triggered in the United Kingdom, that would directly affect us. If they, if they were to trigger that as opposed to the United States triggering that, then we would be sucked into uh, bail-in as as under the provisions of Dodd-Frank at the behest of the triggering of the bail-in mechanism by the United Kingdom. Again, that's, that's a hypothetical, but it's a likely hypothetical. Now, the question there, the final point that I'd, I'd like to make uh, is the, the issue of the difference between order, the orderly liquidation authority and bankruptcy, because the two are very different, uh, even despite what has been done with bankruptcy laws in the United States since the 2005 rewriting of bankruptcy laws. Uh, but uh, the Cornell University Legal Information Institute uh, wrote that Title II of Dodd-Frank is aimed at ensuring that, pay that payout to claimants is at least as much as a claimants would have received under bankruptcy liquidation. The only problem with that is that liquidation during resolution is done at the discretion of the receiver, which in this case is the FDIC, and it's done on the basis of salvaging what, in the view of the receiver, is most critical to financial stability. So that trumps uh, what, what are uh, laid out in Dodd-Frank as the order of operations in bankruptcy, financial stability over everything. Now, as we know uh, from the current financial system, the banks that would be subject to cross-border resolutions are highly leveraged wildly undercapitalized, and they rely on classes of what they call assets, which are in the forms of, for example, derivatives, uh, CDOs, other contracts, uh, whose value, uh, who, where the propping up of the value of those contracts uh, amount to the appearance of stability, or in the bank's case, solvency. Now, uh, we're talking about orderly liquidation as opposed to disorderly liquidation. If you were to create uncertainty in the value of any category of these assets, you would trigger disorderly liquidation, which is not what this, what this bail-in regime, what Dodd-Frank, what the FSB was established to do. Now, in, uh, in an IMF report, titled From Bailout to Bail-In, uh, disorderly liquidation can create risks to overall, overall financial stability through direct counterparty risks, through liquidity risks, and through contagion risks. So the only way these three risks are to be avoided is to prop up the nominal value of those things, which would, uh, who it, which would, in the case of uncertainty, trigger these three risks, and as is stated in Dodd Frank, as is stated in each of these uh, international, um, internationally drafted uh, reports, financial stability is the most important. Uh, the most important aspect. Now, this is going to be published in a in a report for the website. So uh, there's a lot more 
uh, that will be coming as documentation. But what is most essential, especially when we take into account the international scope of, of the bail-in regime and how it has been uh, stuck into the side of the United States by Barack Obama, uh, Dodd-Frank, uh, and, and Barney Frank and uh, Chris Dodd. Glass-Steagall, if implemented as an act of the United States, an act of the sovereignty of the United States, would effectively override Dodd-Frank. It would override this bail-in regime as soon as it is implemented. So this is in part what is at stake, and I've largely taken their, their own words, because I'd like to present in their own words what the, what the program is. And so with that, I would like you to, uh, I'd like to hear your remarks concerning okay. what this means. What this means is the destruction of the United States, and it means implicitly the reduction of the population of the United States by a special kind of genocide. That means that the unwanted eaters, the useless eaters, will be eliminated. It will be eliminated in many ways. They are farmers. Bankrupt them. They die. Employees, they die because everything is reduced to fit these dramas. And there's not enough room in the system, economic room in the system, to sustain the existing population. This is the British Queen's policy, her stated policy. And you see it written in Dodd-Frank. So therefore, the authors of Dodd-Frank have to be treated as fools or worse. That's the issue. Are you going to defend your own life? Are you going to prevent a reduction by, I say, two-thirds or more of the population of the United States by economic means? Are you going to do that? Or are you going to throw John Frank out of here? Because there's an institution in the United States that can o overrule all of this. The U.S. Supreme Court, the supremacy, supremacy of the United States. And I think it's fair to use the following language. We're going to bankrupt those bastards. <laughs>